Now, it might be a minute before we actually get this up on the screen. I have slides. Let's see if that comes up. All right, why, while we wait for that to light up, it doesn't look like it's on. I don't think it's on or warming up yet. Um, so I'm going to, as Albert told you, I'm going to be talking about um, a, a, a solar eclipses. So I don't do my, I, I'm a professor at Swinburne University, as you sort of picked up through this conversation. Um, I study things, uh, my, my work, uh, is involves in studying how galaxies form way back in the universe when they first started forming until now. Also stars in those galaxies when they die, many of them die in an explosion, supernova explosion. So I study those even out to the farthest reaches of the universe so we can see how they behaved early in time to now. And those supernova explosions are incredibly bright. You cannot imagine how much energy they are, but you can see them all the way across the universe. And when those stars explode, the cores collapse, and they can be very compact. They could be a neutron star. All those, all those atoms come together and make a ball of neutrons. So I'll be mentioning neutron stars on Monday. And also, they can even collapse further and make a black hole. So you can have these end products. So I study those things. I also study the fastest, transi the fastest explosions. These things are called transients. Transients are something in the universe that occur over some short time, just randomly. And um, like if you look at the night sky right now, you'll say, or when you look at the night sky anytime, you say, oh, it looks pretty static. There's stars and it looks the same all the time. But once you put a telescope on there, it's chaos. I mean, there's things exploding and moving and all kinds of stuff going on. So I study these things. And um, back in, well, in Einstein's day, um, he, he, come up with, uh, he came up with the theory of relativity. That relativity predicted things called gravitational waves, which I'll talk about on Monday. But those gravitational waves uh, can be detected if you have things like two neutron stars merging together, or a neutron star and a black hole. It's all stuff that I can describe better, but that's my science. It kind of goes from galaxies to stars exploding to gravitational waves and things like that. But today, I'm going to talk to you about a solar eclipse, okay? So, so I'll say a little bit about solar eclipses. I'll discuss um, how, you know, things about them from ground up, just so everybody's on the same page, some interesting facts or, or things about them. I'll talk a little bit about gravity and a theory of gravity. And then I'll mention how a solar eclipse was used to help prove Einstein's theory of relativity. So that's an application of a solar eclipse outside of just, it's pretty, right? Okay, so, so that's my talk. Let's see if this works. All right, so let's start from the beginning. S super straightforward. The Earth goes around the sun. I think we had some conversations about that, right? Does it, does it not? Is it everything around the Earth? But yes, Earth goes around the sun. There's the sun, that dotted line, the Earth going around. And the sun emits light. The light shines. <laughs> okay, maybe it's this. Hmm. Hang on a second. Yeah, let's get this back in. So, there we go. So, we... Okay, so because the sun's shining on the Earth, you know, it's casting a shadow into space. Okay, so that's obvious. So the Earth doesn't emit light, it just reflects light. All good. Then, of course, we have the moon going around the Earth. That's the system, right? It's going around us while we all go around the sun. And, of course, they both cast shadows. So that's the picture, and the moon goes around the Earth from our perspective, as we look at it phase to phase. It takes about 29 and a half days, which is where the month came from, and the moon, everything you've heard about, right? Okay, so that's that. But when it's in an orientation, when the, Earth, the moon is between the Earth and sun, the moon's shadow lands on Earth. And uh, some places on Earth will see that shadow because you see it lined up and you see it lined up with the sun and that's what we're going to witness. And that's gonna look something like this, this little picture here. If I kind of zoom in on that, you see this is a time lapse where snapshots have been taken over time. So there's the sun with the moon kind of just starting to get in front of it. And then it kind of moves over time and it gets more and more in front of it. And then in the middle, it's right in line with the sun. And so it blocks all of the sunlight, and then it starts moving away, and it starts opening up again. Now, these, 
sun, these are in different exposure times. These things are very, you know, fast exposures because the sun's very bright. And here, it's a longer exposure because this little corona, this bright glow, actually is in all of these. It's just faint, much fainter than the sun, so it's not just, it just shows up right then. All right, so then if you had this orientation, now the moon is back here, it's in the Earth's shadow. Okay, and so people, on the first case, people standing right here would look up and see that, but anywhere else you don't really see the shadow on Earth. Here, anyone on this side of the Earth could look up and see that shadow. Does that look, sound, make sense? And so it looks something like this in the night sky. It's called a lunar eclipse. And there's the moon, it's moving along, and you can see the Earth's shadow. It's starting to go into the Earth's shadow. And then it gets into the Earth's shadow completely, and then it starts moving out of the Earth's shadow. Okay, so that's a lunar eclipse, and, and, and well, I'll explain more about that later. So here is like the time lapse pictures, right? Now, if you look at that, you can say, oh, actually, you know, because we have cameras, we can place them, you can, you can do exposure, exposure, exposure. You can see the Earth's shadow. Can you see it? Can you see the size of the Earth there? It's that, right? So the moon is going through our shadow, and that shows you kind of the relative sizes of the Earth to the moon. Now, actually, that's smaller than the Earth because the Earth's shadow kind of narrows the umbra, but that's approximately the ratio. And you can see in this case, the moon kind of just kind of skimmed into the shadow, barely made it. All right, so if we look at that, and the, the moon, I just mentioned a moment ago that they don't emit light, the moon, the sun, hits the moon and reflects light. Same thing with the Earth. So if it's in our shadow, why is it orange or red? You would think it would be black. There's no light on it. It's in our shadow. And that's an interesting thing. Like, why do we, why do we have this? Well, the reason is because on Earth we have an atmosphere. And if you can imagine the sun behind me, and I was the Earth, you know, I've got atmosphere around me. The light from the sun can go through that atmosphere and it can bend, it can refract. And if you're doing that, the sun is going to be, if you're on the earth on that edge where the light's coming through, you're seeing a sunset because you're on that edge and it's kind of where the sun's, you know, the sun's setting for you. Or if you're on the other side, it's a sunrise. You're on that side of the planet. Okay. So, and what color are sunsets and sunrises? They're reddish because they're going through a lot of air and the other wavelengths scatter out. i can say more about that later. So the reddish light comes bending around and shining onto the moon and it makes the moon look reddish. So if you were standing on the moon now and you look up, what would you see for an eclipse? This big earth coming in front of the sun, right? And it would completely block out the sun because it's much bigger than with the size of the sun in the sky from the moon. However, it's got this atmosphere and that light's coming around and shining on you. So you would probably see something. Oh, sorry, that's just showing the refraction, how light will go and refract. So. The light would come around the edge of the Earth and then bend towards the moon. Sorry about that. You would see something that might look like this, and it didn't come out, but this is like a dark lunar surface. But you would see the sunlight coming all around the Earth, illuminating all the atmosphere. So you're seeing every sunrise and every sunset on Earth at the same time. So that's pretty cool, right? So that's an interesting perspective from the moon. All right. So. If the moon goes around the Earth once every 29 and a half days, why don't we have a solar eclipse every 29 and a half days? You know, why does it just happen all the time? Why is this a rare event? And that's because the moon's orbit around the Earth is tilted by about 11 degrees. And so, and that tilt stays the same as it goes around the sun. So in some situations, if the sun's over that direction, when the moon comes between the Earth and the sun, its shadow actually goes over the Earth and misses the Earth. And it might come around down over here, and maybe if the sun were over in this direction, its shadow would go under the Earth. So a lot of times it's just missing. Because this isn't to scale. That moon is really far out, so you only have to be off a little bit to miss. And so you have to be right aligned just right to make it work. And this is supposed to help, but it probably will just confuse. But <laughs> so what they said was, so this plot is supposed to, I mean, this image is supposed to be like, here's the Earth going around the sun. They're all floating in a giant ocean of water for some reason. Okay, so this is water. You got the sun floating and the Earth and everybody. And this, this is when it's even with the water, so it's splashing. This is when it's like underwater, and this is when it's above the water, if you can picture that. Okay? I don't know. It's to give you perspective. Okay? So 
if you're on that side, the sun's shining, and you can see when the moon's here, the shadow goes underneath and misses. And when it's on the back side there, the Earth's shadow, it goes over the Earth's shadow, so it misses there too. And when you're on this side, it's the opposite, right? It misses on top, and it, there, it goes underneath the Earth's shadow. But in these two spots, it's aligned just right, right? It can come around and be right in the right line to make the shadow go onto the Earth. So twice a year is when you're going to have an eclipse. And because it's every 29 and a half days, it's not aligned with our months on the calendar, so that kind of shifts over the years and when that happens. Okay? So if you look at historically, and this is kind of in reference to what I'm going to talk to soon about early 1900s, here are some uh, solar eclipses that happened. Um, and then you can see June, December, June, December, May, November, April, October. It's just doing that kind of, you know, every once a year, you know, twice a year, but it's shifting. And if you look at the lunar eclipses, uh, this is a different plot, kind of stretched. You can see that it's basically just two weeks later, or before, two weeks before, because it takes about two weeks, right, from full moon to, to new. So this is something that tells you that um, eclipses are rare, and, uh, you, but you can predict them, of course. And people are going to see lunar eclipses a lot more than solar eclipses, especially total. And the reason was earlier. You can be anywhere on that side of the Earth and see a lunar eclipse, but you have to be a certain spot on the front side to see a solar eclipse. So here's the shadow of the moon on the Earth from space, and only people in this area can see a total solar eclipse as it moves along. So it's just a small area, and most of the time that's over the ocean. So, you know, good luck with that, right? <laughs> so, so to see one, you've got to travel around the world to catch them. Okay. Now, we've probably seen this plot a lot, or something like it, right? And some of you may, if you're inquisitive, might say, oh, you know, why is it a strip? Why does it curve? You know, what is this? Why is it circle here and, like, weirdly shaped over here? If you look closely, there's four minutes of eclipse here, but there's only like three minutes here and then two minutes. So why is this changing and why is it weird like that? Well, on a flat plane like that, that looks unusual. But you have to remember the Earth's round, right? And so that is just kind of the motion of that moon coming across. It's going to, its shadow, as the Earth's turning and moving, both things are moving, it's going to make a path. And then, of course, this part of the Earth is closer to the sun than this part, because you've gone around a curve. And you can imagine a shadow kind of just changing as it goes around a ball, right? And if you're farther from the sun, the moon is going to be smaller in the sky, and therefore, or farther than that, and therefore it probably will cover the sun less amount of time. All right, so that's the basics. Here is an, a time-lapse movie of a total solar eclipse, something that we're going to, similar to what we'll see. This one was a little shorter than ours, but this will give you an example of what you will experience. So you can see it's time lapse, everybody's moving crazy fast, right? So it's daytime, maybe like two in the afternoon, everybody's kind of hanging out, it's a bright sunny day, everything looks great. But the moon starts covering it, and then you have a total eclipse. So it's almost like it's dusk. And it's interesting because Birds will behave differently. Flies like land on the ground. They don't know what to do. It's just weird, right? And so you have this cooler. You feel cooler. And it happens like this for a while. It's dark. You can see some stars. And then it's back to normal again. So it's just a really a time lapse, of course. So it's much longer than that. But it's a, it's a really cool event. And that's hopefully what we'll experience. OK. So the last bit I'll talk about is why is the moon the same size as the sun in the sky? Because that has to happen for this, for have a total eclipse like this especially for the case of this experiment. Well, it's not the case for other planets. For example, this is a s eclipse on Mars. So on Mars, the sun's farther away, so it's smaller in the sky, but it has a little moon, two little moons, much smaller than our moon. They're not big enough to block it, so you just kind of see it passing by. And even though they're tiny, but they're a lot closer to the surface, so if you're looking at them a lot closer to you, so they look bigger in the sky, they're still not big enough to block and make a total eclipse. And they're not round. Even if it blocks, it's kind of weird. So that's different. But for us, we have a round moon and a round sun, and they're the same size in the sky. It's just 
it's what it is. It's an unusual uh, series of events that led up to this. But the thing is, it wasn't always that way. So we're kind of in a special time, if you think in you know, geologic, astronomical times, we're in a special time that this is the case. But, be, but the moon is currently uh, it's roughly the same size as the sun. Now its orbit isn't a perfect circle, so sometimes it's a little bit farther from us, sometimes it's a little bit closer. It's a little bit elliptic, elliptical, okay? And so as we're going around, sometimes if it's, you know, on a part of, the, of the, its orbit that it's closer to us, it's as big as the sun, or not, if not a little bigger. Sometimes if it's farther in its orbit, it's a little bit solid, smaller than the sun because it's a little bit farther away. And so you'll get either a total eclipse where it blocks out the whole sun or an annular eclipse where this is like an annulus, right, like for a ring. So you're blocking most of the sun, but not all. It's just too far away. Or maybe its orbit kind of takes it on a path like this where it's only blocking some of it, a partial eclipse. So those are the different types of eclipse. <coughs> and we're going to see a total, which is rare. All right, so the <coughs> it wasn't always the same size in the sky. And we know this because astronauts placed a reflector on the moon when they were there. And people on Earth use telescopes backwards. Instead of collecting light, they shoot light out. And you shoot a laser pulse at the moon. That's actually the moon. It looks like the sun, but it's the moon. It's just bright. At the reflector and back. So it times how long light takes to go back and forth. And you can measure the moon very accurately, the distance to the moon. And so that's, uh, that's very interesting. And they've um, measured that it moves about one and a half inches each year away from us. So it's constantly getting farther and farther away. So in the far future, it's going to be too small to make a total solar eclipse. So right now we're in a very fortunate time period. Very early on, it was closer, so it's bigger. It happened. They covered the sun often, more often. So we're in a special time. But you know, one and a half inches is a tiny amount, and it would take like a billion years for us to even notice, or millions of years. So it's not like nobody's going to be worrying that it's gone tomorrow, okay? Actually, the moon, before the moon gets too far away to leave us, the sun will have died, and we've got bigger worries, okay? <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, all right. <laughs> so a question I have for you is, what type of mirror would you put on the moon to reflect the light, that a laser light coming to you, back to that telescope. So now think about this for a second. It's more, com more com there's subtleties here. You've got an observatory on a round Earth that's turning. So you're somewhere on Earth, and you're going to shoot a laser at the moon. Well, the moon's round, and the mirror on the moon is somewhere on the moon, on this surface. Well, if it's off to the side, and you shoot a laser, it's just going to reflect light way out here in space, and you don't get anything, right? So it has to reflect right back to you at all times. And, and as much light as you can, because by the time that laser goes to the atmosphere, gets there, comes back, it's really faint. So you want like as much light as you can to come back to you. So think about this, and at the end of my talk, we'll get the answer, okay? But if you have a good idea, let me know. All right. Okay, so the bottom line of all this solar eclipse talks is that they're interesting, they're pretty, but you can actually do science. And they were used to test the theory of gravity. So a very, very, very <laughs> brief summary okay, of gravity is that if we start with Galileo, for example, we heard a lot about Galileo. He was the first person to use a telescope and study the sky, and at least you know, there's others, but he was the most accepted, so he's the first modern astronomer. And um, you heard other things about his theory of the sun-centric system. Now, he, one thing, though, is he studied gravity and motions of objects, and he found that it does not depend on mass. And there was the famous, right, the story of him dropping two things off of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and they land at the same time, whatever. Who knows if that ever happened? But the point there is that he found out that it doesn't matter how massive something is, it's going to fall at the same speed. Now, that's an interesting insight of what is gravity. If it doesn't care how massive you are, you're going to move the same no matter what. So that was an important insight. Newton came along and did many, many things, but one of the things he did was he developed this theory of motion and gravity, and he described gravity as a force. It's something like it's for attractive force, and it acts at a distance. So you could be anything far away, and it's, it's going to act on you. So it applied it to the planets, and the moon, and the sun, and everything, and says, OK, this is how gravity works. It follows this law, which is pretty straightforward. And that was very accurate, especially using Kepler's and Pachelbel's work, 
showed that you can explain the motions of the planets extremely well and even explain why they would do what they do because there's this force of gravity. And everything works well and we use this today even to, you know, launch rockets, etc. So it works really well for normal situations. Our lives, planets, rockets, it all works really well. But when you get into areas that are more intense, like very massive objects, like black holes, or acceleration, or there were even things like Mercury's orbit around the sun wasn't making sense when you use those laws, that this was, had, they realized it wasn't complete. So, this guy comes along, who you saw earlier today, or oh, no, not who you saw earlier today, but his, yeah, <laughs> exactly, and, and thought about a lot, and, you know, and came up with this concept of space-time, where you're merging two separate concepts, space and time. Usually that was, you think of those as separate. And what it does is it describes how space-time is in the, in the presence of mass. Like if there's something, if you can imagine like a three-dimensional grid and you stick a massive object in there, all of that grid warps because that mass is there. And so space, that space tells how mass to move through it and mass tells how space to warp. So these are the concepts that he came up with. And here's some illustrations of what I mean. Okay, so you say you have an earth and an apple and you're gonna drop the apple. Now if you drop the apple and you were to take snapshots of it as it fell, say every second for example, you would get something like this. So you'd have it and you'd you know, take a snapshot, let's see, and another snapshot and another snapshot as it's falling, okay, and you're taking these pictures. Now if you align those pictures in time, you can see how it's fallen and it falls kind of faster as the longer it goes, and it makes this curve in time as it's falling. So that's what Newton said, is this force of gravity is pulling it to Earth, and it's causing it to make this curve. Einstein said instead, he thinks it's a grid of space, and it's space warping near the Earth that caused it to do this. And so you can see how that warping of space causes the same trajectory, observable trajectory. And that apple is still in the same coordinates on that grid the whole time. It didn't move. It's space that's actually making it move. So this is the concept that he came up with, but you know, is it right? And so you want to test it, but you can imagine it also like this, like that space is just being warped over time because of presence of an object like the Earth, a massive object. And if you were to do it in three dimensions, you'd have something like this. It's kind of crazy, but you got space-time being warped into the Earth. And you can say, okay, I'll place an apple up in one of these coordinate spots, and let's see if it does that, yeah. And then over time, it just falls to the Earth. It stays where it is on its coordinate grid, but it just looks like it's falling to Earth, even though it's not really going anywhere. Now, you might say, okay, why doesn't it keep going into the Earth? And why does it stop when it hits the Earth? And why is the Earth not getting swallowed into the space-time? And that's because the Earth ha is made of atoms, and atoms have electric charges, and electric charges are much stronger than gravity, and their repulsive force keeps them, they keep pushing out. So for example, and so I'm standing here, it's normal, I'm just standing here, there's no, you don't see any forces, you don't see like, why aren't you moving or whatever, but if the floor was, say, pudding, I'd be, I'd fall straight through, right? There's that force pushing me down all, all times, but because this is solid and pushing back, I stay where I am. If you didn't have that, you would fall in, down. And so the earth is pushing out at all times to keep it on the surface. Did I hit that? There we go. So that's the, that's the concept of general relativity and warping of space-time to give the concept of gravity. So yeah, there's pushing out at all times, keeping it in its position. And let's see if that thing goes away. Where's my bar? And then it, it applies to anything like uh, satellites orbiting around. You can imagine this satellite trying to go from like one corner of the grid to the next corner, if you can picture a square grid. Every time it's trying to go corner to corner, that corner is moving, so it keeps trying to chase that corner around and it ends up being a circle and orbit around the object. So that gives you a sense of uh, Einstein's relativity. And there's the, another way people think of it is warping like a flat plane like this. So you say the presence of an object kind of causes this dent 
in space time. And you can see how something would roll around because there's this warping space. Some people like that concept. So that's the moon going around the Earth, and then the Earth will go around the sun. So the idea here is that space time is warped, so things are affected. They, like if you're trying to go on a straight line, it's going to bend because of that. And that's the whole concept of this experiment. So with the Eddington experiment, here's the sun, here's the Earth, and a star that might be over where it says actual star, its starlight is coming out in this direction. It's actually going in all directions, but one of the rays is coming this way and would continue to go this way if there was no sun present, okay? And it would end up over here. But because the sun's there, it bends and ends up hitting the Earth in this case. And that sounds fine. We just realize things bend and it's all good. But if you're on Earth and you see that light coming in like this, you say, oh, some light's coming from this direction. That object is over there. And so you say, oh, it's, that's where I see it, even though it's really over there. So it's moved farther away from the sun because of this warping from your perspective. So, when it, so the problem is now is, oh, let's look at the sun and look at stars around the sun and see if they move. But the sun's really bright. And as you know, when you look up in the daytime, you don't see stars because the sun's so bright. That's a problem. But if an eclipse happens and you block the sun out temporarily, now you can see those stars and you can measure them close to the sun. So that's the concept that we're doing. And so the close stars will look farther away from the sun than they are when there's no sun. And it's just kind of a refraction kind of, I mean, it's kind of similar to refraction where, you know, we know the pencil is really here, but it looks to be here because it's been refracted by water in this case. So it's just the light rays are bent. All right, so now let's test the theory. So there's these people that came along a while back. Um, Freundlich and um, Perrain were without of using a solar eclipse to test Einstein's theory. This is way back to 19, shortly after 1905. So this is like 1910-ish, uh, I think, 11. They said, oh, we could do this to test the theory. And um, the idea is that if, in a solar eclipse, in the case of the one that we're going to look at later, you know, there will be stars in the sky. These are like stars in a constellation Taurus. And you're going to measure them at some point when there's no sun, and then you're going to measure when there's a sun, and you're going to compare the two and say, hey, did they move? And you're going to hopefully see something like this. Normally, they would be the positions of the yellow spots, but when the sun's there, it's going to be where the red spots are. That's the, that's the aim. So they tried this, or they first said, oh, let's, look at, let's look at all what's on record, because this is also 1900, or it was 1911 or so, but they had plates, photographic plates from 1900s, and think about that. I mean, that's a challenge already. I mean, photography isn't that, you know, it was invented too much before that, what, 50 years before that? So you've got a big glass plates and stuff and people taking pictures, and you're thinking, okay, does anything even exist for a solar eclipse? And there were some things. They looked at them, but they weren't useful for this experiment. So they tried to do this in 1912 for a Brazil eclipse, but they experienced a bunch of rain. But they were the first person to try this. Then, Three expeditions said, that's a great idea. Let's do it. So they went to uh, Crimea, where there was going to be an eclipse in 1914. And there were some people from Argentina, Germany, and the US. And here's the people in a picture. This guy looks very excited to be there. <laughs> okay. Um, and I mean, imagine them in some field. They set up the nice tea and everything. And you got to be all prepper. But this is uh, Arthur Eddington. So this is the person we're of interest. But anyway, this is the group that was going to do this. But this is in 1914. Can you think of anything else that happened in 1914? World War I, and they're in Crimea. This isn't a great thing. OK. <laughs> OK, that's right. So World War I happened, not good. Germany declared war on Russia. And so the German people, the astronomers, they were forced to stay home or taken prisoner. This isn't good. Uh, Argentina and US astronomers stayed there, but um, they uh, had clouds. So, you know, they, you could see through some of it, but it wasn't good enough to work. So people are still, you know, persistence, right? And um, again, U.S. astronomers tried in 1918, again clouded out, but gave unclear results. So, and for the 1919 eclipse, was, uh, if you want a Monty Python reference, right, it's like, you know, we built a castle, and it fell into the, into the swamp. So I built another castle, and it fell into the swamp. Build another castle, it fell, it burned down, fell in the swamp. <laughs> but the next one, okay, stay persistent, right? So, so they try to do it. And so Eddington and uh, Frank Watson Dyson uh, organized a, a trip 
where the eclipse is going to come across uh, the Earth in a pattern like this and um, be in Brazil and in this island of Principe in, uh, off the coast of Africa. Eddington went to the Af African location and some other group went to Sobral in, in Brazil. So, but this is now 19, well, in 1917 before this, Eddington was uh, conscripted to war because this is wartime. And, but they made some exceptions. Oh, hey, you know, national interest, you know, keep him out or maybe do some desk job or something. So he kind of was kept out, but then they had to go back in and uh, back and forth. So eventually he was granted this 12 month extension and that was nice because the war ended before that was over and he was able to do this. Okay, that's just kind of putting you stop back and putting you back in that time. And doing that, you have to think about this. This is, you know, pre cars and everything, right? Or mostly. So it's like you got to take a ship, you got to load the ship with equipment, you got to carry stuff on horseback out to the location, you got to build it. I mean, it's it's a lot of work, right? You got photographic plates, and you got to take them in and out. And you can only take a couple per expo. You know, if it's a four-minute eclipse, you get like maybe five images or something because you're trying to get these things through. And then you got to develop them. Hopefully, everything goes well. Then you got to save them and preserve them, take them all the way back because they're the only evidence you have. I mean, this is, you know, back in the day, right? There's no, like, we're going to sit on the internet. So you got to put yourself in your shoes. This is a, this is a tough expedition, okay? Here's um, one of the things they had to build. So this is a, a telescope to study the sun. So they wanted to catch it when it came through, through this reflector into this telescope, and then they were going to take some photographic plates of it and measure these stars. Um, on that, in Brazil on the day of the eclipse, it was cloudy, but it cleared up. And so they were able to get some images from two telescopes. One was, the smaller one was better, that one was kind of blurry. And that's another thing, you don't know if you're totally in focus because you got to develop the film first. <laughs> right? So you're like, let's hope everything's good. So, um, it, so some, they got some stars, about seven stars measured. And then this Prince, Principe, I think, is, uh, had a storm and rain too, but it kind of cleared and they were able to get about five stars accurately. So they were measured as carefully as they could, and those measurements showed that the deflection was in agreement with what Einstein had predicted. Okay, so then there was a lot of hooray, you know, media, and I love this headline, right? Lights all askew in the heavens, men of science more or less agog over the results of the eclipse observations. And it says, I like the stars were not where they seemed or were calculated to be, but no one need worry. Okay, <laughs> okay, it's all good. We're all good here. And then, of course, you know, general relativity. You know, only twelve people can understand it, right? Anyway, so it's an interesting headline in the news. But this is also in the newspaper, and I thought this was actually really well done. This explains like everything, right? You've got the setup, right? It's looking at the sun. It's looking at a star, it's seeing it at a deflection, right? Here's the picture of the sun and the movement of the stars away from the sun. I mean, that's, this is actually done pretty well done. So whoever did this was pretty well on it. So that's great. So this happened and everybody's like, great, yay, you know, Einstein, yay, cheer, I'm on. So success, and they're like, eh, okay, because we've got like, what, 12 stars, sort of measure, looks pretty good, it's just, you know, not, not your best thing. So um, another expedition, keep going, which I'll spend a little time on is the Trumpler expedition. So R.J. Trumpler and a team, including uh, Campbell from the Lick Observatory, uh, went to Australia for an eclipse. Yeah, let's hear it for Australia. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's it. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. So, um, exactly. And the conditions were great and sunny, as you would expect in Australia, right? So, no, so they had a great time. Sort of, okay, because, but they measured a lot of things, a lot of stars, uh, approximately 200 or so, so they had a, a good measurement of this. But here's, here's some pictures of the drama, right? You got a ship, you're loading stuff into the beach out in the middle of nowhere, horseback riding over to wherever you're going to, and then just doesn't look like a lot of fun, right? A lot of work. Then you got to build these things in the middle of nowhere, these gigantic telescopes, and make sure they're working well, right? And so, you know, some of them are gigantic, Right, so this is a big structure you've got to build in some desert area to do this. And um, this is an example of one of the photographic plates. So very big glass plates. And remember, they're negatives, right? So this is the black sun, and this is the corona, and stars are in reverse, right? It's a negative photograph. 
So that's what they're dealing with, these giant glass plates to measure the clips. This is RJ Trumpler, and looking pretty cool. I think that's a pretty cool shot, working on some calculations with a whole bunch of shipping boxes. And then this is uh, him working at the telescope, getting the data. So the data were gathered, and they, um, yeah, they got a lot more images, and they also had uh, some reference images of those same stars taken from Papiete, Tahiti, which is an island in the Pacific in Polynesia. It's, uh, well, Tahiti. And um, they were taken as reference images, like here's where the stars are without the sun, and then they took the ones in Australia with the sun, and you compared those two, so it was done uh, pretty well calibrated. This has a close spot in my heart because I'm trying to build an observatory over here. So I've been here and I've tried to work on and been in that area and they, they're very proud of the fact that they were part of this expedition. Um, so here are some of the data. So, you know, you be the judge. So this is in French, so that just says basically the deviation in arc seconds, which is a measurement on the sky. And this is the distance from the edge of the, edge of the sun in solar radii or whatever. So it's basically saying as you go farther from the sun, how much deviation from where it should be. And so the green line is what you would get from Newtonian gravitation, the red is from Einstein. And so do you think those match the red one or the green one better, right? <laughs> red, red better, but pretty messy still, right? But we're in a better place, right? And then more modern day is something like this by some, a couple people that I looked up. So it's a little more convincing. I guess you could say, in more accurate measurements. So this is showing you that as, if you're really close to the sun, that star is far off of where it should be. And as you get farther away from the sun, it, it's more to where it is without the sun's presence. So the sun is making a difference, and it's warping space-time as predicted. Yep. Solar radii. Solar radii. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Yep. Yep. Um, so then, you know, they, they telegrammed uh, everyone, okay, including Einstein, and you can read it here, it says, you know, three, well, so three pairs, of, that's very short because it's uh, uh, telegraphs, so you use minimal words. Three pairs of Australia Tahiti eclipse plates measured by Campbell Trumpler, 62 to 84 stars each, five of six measurements completely cal calculated give the results between 1.59 and 1.86 seconds of arc, Mean value is 1.74 seconds of arc. Einstein predicted 1.73. That's pretty good. Okay, and we it, we not repeat Einstein test next eclipse. Okay, so they they're like, we're good. Okay, <laughs> all right, we did it. We're done. <laughs> okay. Einstein sent a letter back. It's in German. I don't know if you how good your German is, or at least it was the secretary of Einstein. But I kind of did a thing here. Translation. So it actually says, like, dear honorable professor, Professor Einstein commissions me to convey his warmest thanks to you for a detailed telegram with pleasant content to express his admiration for the measurements carried out with such great care and kindness, and, you know, et cetera. So that was to the team saying, you know, thanks for making me a superstar. All right. So, um, yeah, more accurate imaging sense has confirmed it more. There's radio measurements, so you can use radio telescopes that aren't affected. Similarly, you have to worry about an eclipse using quasars. And there's even gravitational lens images now because we have digital cameras and large telescopes and accurate things. And for gravitational lensing, here's the concept. It's the same thing as I explained. Here's the Earth. Instead of a sun, we've got a cluster of galaxies. Okay, so a bunch of galaxies, a lot of matter, a lot of mass, warping the space. And then you might have a galaxy far away that happens to be behind that cluster from your point of view. Well, the light from that galaxy is going all directions, but some of them will come out this way and kind of get bent. Some will get bent this way, and then one will, a ray of, of light from that might come bent this way and come to Earth. Another one will bend around that way and come to Earth, and then out and out and out. So if you're at Earth, you would see that galaxy over there and over there. You would see two of them, which is interesting. And they actually can be warped where their shape is, is an arc, and they look kind of like this. So here's the galaxies. These are galaxies from behind it being warped around, and you see multiple images. So you can see from this, you don't need an eclipse, but you know it takes a Hubble Space Telescope to do that. 
here's some more, another one with a beautiful cluster of galaxies and lots of lens. You can see those arcs in there of the galaxies. So that's the beautiful arcs, how things get gravitationally lensed as they go across the universe. And this is due to general relativity. And there's even cases where a galaxy will line up with a galaxy almost perfectly. And you get this wonderful, almost ring of a galaxy. It's really cool. Okay. So that is, um, in short, how a, an eclipse helped prove general relativity, which is how space is warped. Back to our question about lasers. Does anyone know how you would shape a mirror to reflect it back exactly the way it came to you? So it comes at you, it comes right back. Say again? Carefully. <laughs> what is it? Parabola? If it comes in, it'll send it to a focus. So that probably wouldn't work too well. Like a parabola this way? So the light comes in, it'll come up to a focus. So that's a spot, but then if you're coming this way, that focus has to be, I guess, the Earth. And it, but then if it's pointing over here, yeah. So it's a good idea. Right, go ahead first, yeah, sorry. What is it? A sphere would be good because it would hit it, but you would get very little of that light. Most of it would reflect off. So it's a good idea, but you're gonna be a very weak response. That's really close, if I'm understanding you. Okay. One last. Can you just like incline, like flat mirror, but you incline certain angles, certain degrees, so that you can place the light on the way back to where you want it? Yeah, but as things move, or you're moving, you can move it. Yeah, that's, that's possible, <laughs> but you've got to... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's actually a really, really simple answer, and I don't mean to... It's a corner mirror. So if you take three mirrors and make a inside of a cube, any direction light comes in will bounce around and come back the same way. And this concept is used in reflectors and reflective paint. Because you ever think when you're driving down the road, why is that street or sign really bright at me, just at me for some reason, and no one else, and as I pass by, and then it goes to the next person, right? So I'm going to pass this around, and it can be around. But you can, this is one of these broken open, and you can see the tiny little cube, square cube mirror, you know, sections inside. And so you know, reflective paint is kind of the same thing. It's got maybe little spheres, like you're saying, but little pieces in the paint that the light will reflect, and then come back out the same way it came in. All right. And so this is the set of all these are a bunch of little reflectors, those corner cubes. The light hits it, reflects back. Um, I think it's about maybe half a meter or something, you know, something. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. So it's pretty small. It has to fit on a lunar module and stuff, right? And it's in this location. One of them is in this location if you were to care. Okay? <laughs> so that's it. All right. So um, thank you. Now, I have some time, and I don't know if I, it's okay if I use a few minutes, because I did kind of end earlier than I thought, okay? Um, if I have time, I wanted to, I heard a lot uh, here about just trying to figure it out, scientists trying to figure this out, creative thinking, et cetera. So in the meantime, I made up a couple slides of some creative things. So first, I'll talk about Aristophanes. So this is the person that lived about 100 years, 200 BC. He, people had thought the Earth was a sphere. He me actually measured its size using creative thinking, a stick. Okay, that's a technical tool, okay? A straight stick and some math. So that takes a lot of creativity. And so, you know, when we, I talk to you about the lunar eclipse, you know, you might see that and that and that. And back when the days before you have photography, you're like, oh, you know, I'm trying to piece together what's going on there. But if you have photography, you, you know, I told you that you can see the Earth's shadow there. So people thought the Earth was probably round. And so the story goes, um, he worked in the uh, Library of Alexandria, going through some scrolls and read this one scroll about someone writing that, oh, on, on June 21, which is the um, winter, uh, summer solstice in the Northern Hemisphere, so on June 21, the sun is at its highest point in the sky, 
they said the sun actually shines all the way down this really deep well on that day, but not other days. Okay, and they, that's interesting. And he said, well, I live in Alexandria, and on that same day, it doesn't go to the bottom of my well. It never gets to the bottom of my well. Why is it there and not here? So he thought about that, and most people might say, that's interesting, put the scroll away, go have coffee, right? But he thought about it, he's like, there's, mm, okay? <laughs> so, so he said, okay, so here's the situation. You're in Africa, Alexandria's up here, this is a town called Syene, and that's where that, they said, oh, the sun's rays come in on that day, and it's right down at the bottom of the well, that's interesting. Well, he lives up here, and it doesn't get to the bottom of his well. And you can see why. Those rays will come in and not make it to the bottom. I mean, that's exaggerated wells, of course, but you get the idea, right? So, but he thought about this and says, maybe this is the case. The earth is round, I'm on a curved area, and it's not getting into mine. So if I set up some sticks, I would say, in here, I wouldn't see a shadow on that day, because the sun's directly overhead. But here, I would see a shadow, and if I measure that shadow, that tells me this angle, that little geometry angle. And that angle is the same as that angle. And so he says, if I can measure that thing, I can tell you how much of the earth I'm covering. So then I guess, as the story goes, he paid somebody to pace it off the distance, which is like, you know, 400 miles or something. You know, that would have been a good trip. But you get that measurement, and you say, if this is seven degrees, and seven degrees is X number of miles, multiply around 360 degrees, that's how big the earth is. And he was right, okay? That's pretty cool, right? That's creative thinking. So that's a, that's a cool thing. And so that, the second is Aristarchus. I can't not mention Aristarchus. So we talk about the, Earth, the moon being the same size as the sun. And you say, okay, that's interesting. And as we know, it's kind of a special time in the universe that it's that size. But, you know, are, when you're living back then, are they the same size? You know, one seems to be behind the other. So maybe the sun's a little bigger, but how far is it compared to the moon? What other sizes comparative? So he, creatively, well, he was actually the first person that put forth this idea of the sun-centered cosmology way back then. He said, hey, I, gotta, I, I, can, I can figure this out. When I look up and I see the moon, when you see the phases of the moon, you see, at one point you see where it's just exactly half illuminated, right? It's like first quarter moon. You're like, oh, that's like a perfect half. That's really cool, right? And then, some a little over two weeks later, you see it again, but in the morning, it's the third quarter, okay? And it goes through all of its phases. Well, he says, well, if the sun is shining on the moon, which we believe it is, that angle between me and the moon when it's perfectly half, if I'm standing here, is going to be 90 degrees. The sun's shining 90 degrees at it. So he says, well, the sun is 90 degrees away from wherever I'm seeing that moon. Sounds great. And then he says, but if the sun's this far away, you know, the moon is going to be about here. But if the sun is really close, the moon's going to be over here to be 90 degrees. And he said, well, if I time how many, how many hours or whatever it takes, days it takes for the moon to go from first quarter to third quarter, and then third quarter to the first quarter, if it's really long this way and very short this way, the sun's really close. But if it's, you know, short, if it's even, the sun's like at infinity. Right? But if it's, so he says, what's the difference between how long it takes for the moon to go phase to phase? And he also figured that the sun would be about 400 times as far away as the moon, and look at that. Right? So he realizes that it has to be much bigger than the moon because it's much farther away. And that started the whole idea that the sun's gigantic. Maybe that's the center, and maybe not Earth or whatever. So this is really creative thinking using just your brain and curiosity. Right, so I just wanted to add those bits of people just trying to trying to figure it out. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Thank yep. Brief tip team.